when the offshore was launched, mm -hmm. there was mixed reviews. Yeah, because actually Emmanuel gets to explain that at some point he was in Italy and the retailer was not so convinced by the offshore saying, ah, it's too big, I don't mm -hmm. think I have the customers. And then he just tell, told him, imagine, the guy is sitting in his Ferrari, he has the, 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 the arm on the window. That's the perfect watch to go with it. <laughs> was sufficient to convince him. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to La Brasseau in Switzerland. Uh, I am sitting here with someone I'd like to introduce you to. This is the manager of Heritage and Archive at Audemars Piguet, uh, Raphael. Yes. How are I, you? Fine and you. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Raphael is probably casting a strong impression on you right now, leading <laughs> from the wrist. Uh, Raphael, I'm really glad you wore your daily beta here today. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a discreet watch. <laughs> exactly, just something but, under the radar, you know, yeah. but this, there's a reason we're both wearing, I mean, this is about as, as out there as I could go because Raphael went in and, and took, took the best option. But we are, we're gonna have a fun discussion today because it's about the offshore being the playground for the Royal Oak. And it's about the fact that over its history, there have been relentless and almost just, I find it hard to imagine how, how crazy some of these have been, how bold, how devil may care, a brand that's generally quite, can be quite conservative has been with this collection. But that's, our, that's what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And yet, I do want to say one thing about the offshore right off the bat, because I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for the offshore. Yeah, really? Yeah. Hmm. Do, you wanna, do you wanna turn to interviewer now and say, why, Andrew? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was one of the questions that I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, Raphael, how, how come that you came from the offshore first yeah. to then know about our map again? Well, it's one of these things where it, it just dawned on me five minutes ago as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, when I first came into watches in the, because when the watch was released in 1993, I was 17. And I was uh, in high school, and I was not, uh, I was not in that Audemars Piguet world mm. at all. And yet, when I came into journalism, say, six, seven years later, and I was putting together watch magazines for retailers, the watches that always stood out to me were the big, bold sports models. These watches that, that were me more, for mm. me at that time, more youthful, more, and more something my dad wouldn't wear. Whereas, you know, my dad would comfortably wear a 15202. Or That's a... actually a cool uh, thing that you say, because when the watch was presented in 93 in the Basel Fair booth, a lot of retailers came to see the watches and uh, the re they were not convinced at all. But what they didn't think is that a lot of those retailers were with their sons. Ah. And their sons said, no, no, but I want this watch for me. It's not for you. Yeah. And that's what, that's actually something that, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I think I saw one of the models in this collection that we're going to go through today. Because what we're going to do today is we're going to choose the five watches that represent the most playful and the most bold decisions that, that AP have made through the offshore collection over the years. But one of them is definitely a model that I put into a magazine in probably 2002 that has a rubber bezel. It's a gold watch. Yeah, that's this one here. Yeah, and and this is this is not part of our five playful watches. This is the Andrew watch. This is the one that's that absolutely personified to me at the time what I would wear if I was successful, if I had any money, if I was <laughs> if if I worked out more at the gym. So this watch actually first twigged my interest in Audemars Piguet when the, the young Andrew picture the the artist as a young child. This is the watch that got my attention to this brand. And then of course when I come into watches and my taste mature and I get older and I, I have children and I do come into money, I then seek a, a Royal Oak because you, you're wearing different clothes. So I want to start just by saying that I just don't think I'd even have this level of sustained interest in Audemars Piguet and the Royal Oak if it wasn't for the offshore. And I think that that's an interesting place to start. Mm -hmm. That we, we talk about a cycle, don't we? And, mm -hmm. and that we are, have you seen, tell me about your idea of the cycle because I I have seen the cycle now complete. So offshore comes in 93, steel version, a big version of the Royal Oak, mm -hmm. very masculine, 42 millimeters, extremely thick, gasket big with also the rubber on the push piece and on the crown. Yes. 
2001, we come with the rubber version that is taking a step forward in that direction. So using rubber, also introducing rubber in a luxury watch, something that was not quite common at the time. Rubber band, of course, sports watch. It's easier to have a rubber band than a leather one. And here we have the rubber applied on the bezel. That is actually a gold bezel. This is interesting. I, I did some research. This, is, this can only be called a gold watch if all the components are gold. Yeah. Uh, so if this bezel had in fact been ceramic or any other material, mm. this would not be able to be called a gold watch, which is why yeah. you covered a gold. <laughs> uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you take a precious metal and cover it in rubber? <laughs> now, I want to get playing. Um, and I have chosen five things in the archive myself that, that mm. stand out to me as being uh, where AP have pushed the boundaries. And in a way, sometimes I think with a, with a bit of a smile on their face, can we talk about the, I think this is one of the heaviest watches in existence. <laughs> I want to go straight to the, to the weight, straight to the weight. That's got a nice <laughs> ring to it. Let's have a talk about a 430 gram white gold model here. So I have to struggle a bit to find it and actually to play with it. Yeah. Because that is the one. If you could see, there are three different ones of the, the offshore model. We have the steel version, that is actually the first one that came out mm -hmm. in 93. Titanium, so almost half of the weight. And double of the weight, Yeah, white gold version. So this is, uh, I believe this to be, certainly the platinum model is this the heaviest watch of so, all time? This is the white gold model. The heaviest is the platinum one. Yes. But it's just a few dozens of grams more. So, so this is 430 grams. Mm -hmm. This is nearly half a, half a kilo of, uh, of watch on your wrist in white gold. And, you know, many people, including Jean-Claude Bibber, have said that this mm -hmm. is truly the absolute epitome of excess in watchmaking. So that's, that's <laughs> playful, but it's also... In a way, in a world of flexi flex, this is the ultimate flex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This could be too. <laughs> Drop the mic on me there. I'm saying this is the ultimate flex, and meanwhile, I can barely even see straight. Because, because if you just see also here, just the amount of diamonds just on the buckle. <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, that is a very good point. I've, I've been. If this was a competition, that would be one Raphael, mm. zero Andrew. <laughs> I want to show you, Raphael, how much of an um, offshore fanboy I am. W what am I showing you right now? Oh, a picture with Emmanuel Getz. So <laughs> last week, I was at Geneva Watch Days in Geneva, and I heard that Emmanuel Giet was in town, and I managed to track him down. And, and I spent an amazing couple of hours with Emmanuel Giet talking about this, this watch here in steel. Uh, and I just want to draw a link to this one I'm holding now because this watch in steel defines his career in many ways. It's what made him someone that is a borderline uh, celebrity in, mm -hmm. in the, the pantheon of watch designers. And there is a whole folklore around that watch, uh, around that, that launch and that moment. But I just want to say that his one comment was we had no idea that it would become what it's become. And, and there was a sense of an abandon about the release. There was some resistance to it, but it was still, he still looks at me with wonder when I said, the offshore, wow, your crowning mm -hmm. achievement. He's like, it was a design. We mm -hmm. had no idea this would happen. Yeah, actually, it's also what uh, he told me recently. Also that um, he said, I was young. <laughs> I was young and one of the directors, uh, told him to draw the watch, uh, a, new, a new version of the Royal Oak, to reach a new audience. And actually, he said, yeah, we dared to present the watch, but he had to fight to have it produced. Because a lot of people said, but why do you want to do that? Mm. This is not AP. This is too big. Who wants to wear this? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and strangely enough, I've been in this game long enough to have known the person that actually signed off on this watch and, and interviewed him many times. This is Mr. Stephen Urquhart, mm -hmm. who went on to become the uh, president of Amiga, which is where I crossed paths with him many times. 
but I can imagine he's not an easy customer because the, the quote, the key quote from that first feedback session with Emmanuel was, mm. this is huge. <laughs> I don't know if I can tell the whole story of how the decision was made at some point, but Emmanuel explained me one of particular meeting in 91 where he was still working on the project and it was still some resistance. And at some point he got a bit fed up and he had a friend that lent him a watch, mm -hmm. a sea dweller. Yeah. And he actually came to the meeting and put the watch on the table to say, this has a lot of audience mm -hmm. and this is not small. <laughs> so there is room for big watches. Yes. And at that moment, Steve Aquat said, well defended, we'll make your watch. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are today. And that was the beginning of, I think, a bit of a sen an internal at AP sense of, if we're not quite sure about an AP model, we'll just, we should do it. <laughs> now, a couple of years after the launch in 1996, I want to point out the fact that this watch in 1996 was released in eight colors mm -hmm. and also in different sizes. So it was an entire sort of modification of the... Given to show you an archive from 97. Yep. And we have the presentation of the colors in different sizes, different colors. But actually, this is a picture of a window mm -hmm. for the Basel Fair in 97. Emmanuel Gert was preparing the Basel Fair. It was the 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak. And at some point, there was one big window, and he wasn't sure exactly what he wanted to put inside. Mm -hmm. And then he said, ah, we could uh, make a, a rainbow of offshore. Wow. And that's what he did. Yeah. And, and course, they made it almost as a joke. Mm -hmm. But when the people came, they were crazy, like kids yeah. saying, oh, I want the red. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, we now take this for granted, don't we? This is not uncommon now. No, but at, at no. this point, for, for luxury watches of this, this kind to be in a profusion of colors and sizes was... Who wants an like, apple green watch? But in fact, it's fun. Somebody did, <laughs> yeah. So there's a straight up playful iteration that I think yeah. really mm. sums up, again, a bold move and a playful move that, that got the world attention. <laughs> Because then we had the, yeah, like here, the brown version, mm -hmm. uh, red and, and also on. The eight colors that were also displayed in different sizes. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. So when the watch was launched, it was marketed. And the, the discussion about this watch was that we had suddenly the, the ultimate masculine watch. Mm -hmm. And there was no sense that it was going to necessarily go into a you know smaller line extension. But again, in a playful and I would say sort of a, a middle finger move, it's like, well, no, actually, the first extension of this watch will be into, so the, the original was called the Beast and this was playfully called the Baby Beast, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it talked me through it. Yeah, that's a, that is a, like a ladies version, mm -hmm. 30 millimeters, self-winding. So, yeah, the same code as the big one, but in smaller size. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that we have the first model that stays for four years the same size as the Royal Oak, same as the Royal Oak. First four years is one model, one material, mm -hmm. uh, one this size. This one over here. Yeah. Yep. And then 96. Ladies version, 30 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So from 42 and 30 millimeters. <laughs> and then 97, a whole collection. Yes. With also mid size models of 38 and, and so on. Show so, me one of your other favorite limiteds. I would say this one, mm -hmm. Alinghi, 2003. Ah, the pride of the Swiss. So this is, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot come to Switzerland without hearing this story again. And uh, someone's pointed out that people still wear the cap from this year to, to, uh, to, to prove to the world that the Swiss can sail. You've won it a few times, but this was not expected. And AP yeah. commemorated the, the Alinghi World Cup win mm. in, uh, what year was that? It was 2003, yeah. This, and then uh, five and seven, did you win uh, it again? 27, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 2007, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, but basically this was one of the collaboration that inspired us also in materials uh, and uh, also the chronograph that is made for the regatta. Mm -hmm. That was also something that uh, 
we also tried tried to innovate also in terms of um, of complications. It was not just a simple chronograph, but something that would actually be useful for the team, for the sailing team. But unexpectedly, they won. So <laughs> it brought a huge visibility. This is like literally <laughs> betting on one number and, and a roulette wheel and, and it coming home because it was not expected, but you, you suddenly had the biscuits. Yeah. And it, it, this brought a lot of visibility for mm. Marpiguet, even in Switzerland, where the brand was not so known at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. Yeah. So this brought then a lot of other uh, collaborations. I, because we were mentioning, for example, Alinghi, then we made a watch in 2005 and in 2007. That is an important one because it's a forged carbon version. It was the first one in forged carbon. Yeah. So a material very light that inspired us, uh, that was inspired by us from this sailing world, but not so easy to work with. And I have here another version of the forged carbon case with the ceramic bezel, gem set. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, yeah. that's the only way you roll. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a combination also of, uh, yeah, sports attributes with yes. diamonds. Yes. <laughs> and look, we, we have some sports collaborations that have mm -hmm. some notoriety, but nothing's quite on the level of your pop culture collaborations. And that is not, you are not wearing the shack, but the shack probably is known to you because mm -hmm. it is the most mon monstrous <laughs> jet diamond set piece you have ever seen. 48 millimeters. Yeah entirely diamond covered it has it's got a few little easter eggs in there like the inverted shacks numbers you have had some limited editions with the biggest stars on the mm -hmm. planet uh can you tell me about the one that changed everything so that different ones i will begin with this one yes terminator 3 so arnold schwarzenegger we made many different collaborations with him the first one was the end of days in 99 mm -hmm. Then this was 90, uh, 2003 for the beginning uh, for the the uh, outcome of the movie. Actually, I'm wearing a gem scent version of this one, but this one is 48 millimeters, 54 with a protect of the push piece. Yeah. But titanium, so very light to wear. And uh, yeah. And these these collaborations started from authenticity because if we move on to to Jay Z and I hope that there's something of this limited edition in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, there's usually random things around, but with Jay Z, I will get it. Thank you. <laughs> Jay Z owned, I believe, over ten Audemars Piguet at the time that he proposed an addition with Francois, who at that time, who, who was the CEO for many years, but who at the time was the CEO of America. And uh, it took some time to get this addition together, but Jay Z, I suppose, achieved the dream in being able to so, co-create a watch. I don't have the watch here. Yeah. But I have the box mm -hmm. that had a special feature on it, an iPod. <laughs> this is so great. So the story here is that the, the idea initially was to, to do 100 pieces and to engrave a song. Oh, is that actually signed? No, it's an engraving that is on the iPod. That's so cool. I didn't notice that it was signed. Huh. And you can, uh, you can read what's written on it. But this was not originally what was planned. Originally, they were going to be uh, engraving song names into the backs of the watches. Realized that there was that was a little too playful because there were some words that we couldn't engrave. So yeah. the, the sort of the middle ground was to put all of Jay Z's songs to that point on an iPod and to engrave. I'm so far ahead of my time. I'm about to start another life. Look behind you. I'm about to pass you twice. Classic Jay Z. Yeah, it's quite classic. <laughs> but this came with the watch. So again. A super playful, and you can imagine opening this box at the time. Mm. The iPod was new technology, yeah, and you really had the ultimate road trip companion because every and this has been used. This is scratched up. I think Francois must have taken this on a few road trips. But uh, <laughs> so we have here five ways that AP has played it different. They've played mm. outside the lines. They've played with a sense of you know again that devil may care. We're going to to use this platform to push boundaries and see where we mm. land. And certainly in my case, it was the bridge between the original launch of the Royal Oak, mm -hmm. the decline of the Royal Oak, the launch of the offshore, which then brought it to new audiences, me included. And then as I matured and changed, I then cycled back into wanting a Royal mm -hmm. Oak and I have two uh, and they're not offshores. So it's actually been this bridge for many people yeah. between these, these very dominant eras for the, the Royal Oak that we, that we love and hold mm -hmm. dear. And of course, if we finish on one piece, it's the 25th anniversary, which to me is a little bit of a, 
a hybrid of the the, the concept. Yeah, this is the twenty fifth anniversary of the offshore. This year, uh, sorry, it was two thousand and eighteen. We wanted to, of course, pay tribute to the story of the offshore, and we made it through two different models. One of them was an homage to the first edition in the same proportion, 42 millimeters, with the same, when we brought back the Petit Tapisserie dial mm -hmm. in the offshore. The base and, is back. Yes. Yep. Iteration that we now have as the Black Ceramic Edition that came out uh, this year. Mm -hmm. That is uh, bringing back this idea of evolving the original one. Mm -hmm. And also, on the, uh, for this anniversary, we made a uh, like futuristic movement where we wanted to have and use the shape, the huge shape of the watch and to make a movement that is huge also in the watch, but that you can actually deep inside. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a wink to the concept because we removed the dial and played with the movement in a 3D. Um, You've even covered the screws in the sapphire crystal. Yeah. Even yeah. even though, yeah, it's all, the glass covers everything. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of elements of the design that are very different from what we can expect from an offshore. But for me, it's also to say, this is also what the offshore could have been and could be. Mm. Okay. And uh, yeah, it is also bringing back some horological savoir-faire and also futuristic approach. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a question for you because what... I talked about my story and the mm. and the offshore, <laughs> uh, and I want to hear yours. Where, did you come into Audemars Piguet loving this model? Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that many models from uh, Audemars Piguet uh, before joining. I was already enjoying watches, but when I first discovered Audemars Piguet when I joined here ten years ago, one of them my first love was for the classical complications like uh, and also specialties like the star wheel mm -hmm. the royal oak had a, a space in my heart but was not yeah was growing on me but the offshore for me was like oh it's too big it's mm -hmm. not my thing but after years it really grew on me and now i and yeah after seeing all the <laughs> different him now yeah <laughs> <laughs> I can almost look like comfortable with a, such a watch. <laughs> and that's the thing I want to finish with. Like, If you're watching this having never experienced an offshore, you, you may have the same thought, that this watch is just un, unfriendly to the wrist. It's, it's not, it doesn't have the same consideration for wearability, for elegance, and for, for this classical style. But I do encourage you to go and start the process because... I'm, I ended up thinking, no, 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 I'll never return now that mm. I'm through my youthful days. But AP continue to, to just modify the watch enough to keep you interested. And certainly the 2021, mm. um, the, the change in movement to the correct configuration of yeah. 3, 6, and 9, <laughs> uh, and also the, the change to um, all very many details that affect wearability made mm. that one that, that jumps up to me as one that I want. But it's a cool story, and look, I think that you've climbed the offshore mountain and you have ended up at the top, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but what I would say also is that these watches, as always, when you wear them, I can always look at the watch and find something cool to see. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is always one of the points of why I enjoy watches. It's each time I'm wearing it, although I know it, you can always look at it and say, ah, oh, yeah, that's nice. It's something new every day. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been, a, I've learned a lot of new things today. I thank you very much for taking us through this. Thank you. <laughs>